an important and brutal war that you've probably never heard of. A tribe of well-armed mounted warriors as tough as any in Africa. A handful of surrounded colonial officials and soldiers, massively outnumbered and outgunned. Now if that hasn't caught your attention, then I don't know what will. Today we're talking about two sieges and the battles to relieve them during the Basutu Gun War of 1880-81. It's an important and almost forgotten conflict in the mountains around the modern day state of Lesotho. Yep, this tiny one in southern Africa. I'm joined by my good mate Cam Simpson, a regular on the show, who's writing a book on the war and is going to describe the battles and characters involved and then explain how these sieges were like mini Rourke's drifts. In fact, they probably deserve their own Hollywood movie. Let's find out more. So today we're going to be discussing the defence and relief of Mafeting and Mahali's Hope during the Basuto Gun War of 1880-1881. There were four other sieges that took place at different periods during the Gun War. In Basutu land there was Maseru and Flotsi Heights, and in the Transkai there was Maclear and Solo. They're all equally important, some a little bit more dramatic than others, and we'll cover these in other episodes later on. So looking at Mafeting, Mafeting was invested by the Basutu for 38 days, 12th September through to the 19th of October 1880, and Mahali's Hope, that was invested by the Basutu for 15 days, 20th September through to 4th of October 1880. Now just briefly looking at the background to all this, why was there a gun war? This was predominantly due to the Disarmament Act that the Cape government had passed at the end of the Ninth Frontier War. And during the Morosi Rebellion, and Morosi, remember, was a vassal of the Basutu, and the Cape government fought Morosi pretty much for the entirety of 1879 down in the southwest corner of Basuto land, and ultimately they defeated him. The Basuto, though, they provided contingents to go down and fight against Morosi. At the same time, the Premier of the Cape, Gordon Sprigg, had arrived and that Pizzo had said, well, you're, you're fighting with us, but we're also going to disarm you as well. Okay, from the Basuto side, this is not good news. But they also saw how Morosi, with just a few hundred men, had made a complete mockery of the Cape government. So the Basuto, faced with the thought of disarmament, were perplexed at how they were going to deal with this. What course of action did they take? The majority felt that they needed to go into rebellion. 23,000 Mata Basuto could be put into the field. Unlike neighbouring tribes, they had studied the way that the Cape and Imperial forces operated. They'd studied the Boers closely. They'd fought the Boers in 1865. When they put mounted troops into the field, they referred to them as commandos as well. Like the Boers, they would seek opportunities to exploit. They were not interested in fighting war of attrition. They're not going to put a commando in the field and needlessly whittle away numbers. They would prefer to abandon villages for the sake of preserving life over mud and timber and the opportunity to fight again another day. The Basuto were also armed with modern weapons. They had Martini Henrys, they had Snyders, Wesley Richards and even Winchesters. They did also have old muzzle loaders but however they were considered even by the Cape government as being better armed than them. They did carry traditional weapons such as a Segai, battle axes and shields. Now down in the Macero Mahali's Hoke area, which we're going to be discussing about at the moment. This area was controlled by um, Chief Leratoli, who was a charismatic man, a man that was greatly respected by the Cape forces and also the Boers. He'd fought in the 1865 war, and he was a man that the Basuto nation could rally around. And with commandos such as Fierce Eyes and Finishers of the Wounded, um, Leratoli was a man that was going to bring the war to the um, colonial forces. Interestingly enough, Sergeant Harry Wound of the CMR 
in his 25 years soldiering in South Africa, had said that the CMR was just one regiment against a tribe like the Basutu, a well-armed and mounted race of men far superior in every way as fighting men to any tribe in South Africa, Zulus not accepted. An interesting fact remains that at the conclusion of the gun war, the Basutu were never defeated. An armistice was agreed. Never before had that been, has anybody witnessed anything like that in South African native warfare. It's quite remarkable, really, in testimony to the fighting capabilities of the Basutu. Following the Morosi Rebellion of 1879, there are a number of changes that occurred in the Cape Forces. Predominantly, there was the appointment of the Commandant General of the Cape Forces. This was now Colonel Charles Mansfield Clark, the 57th Regiment. He was a veteran of the Indian Mutiny, Maori Wars, Zulu War. And in fact, he'd actually commanded the column at the tail end of the Zulu War during the pacification operations. His assistant, Adjutant General, Principal Staff Officer, was Major William Cochran of the 32nd Foot, a survivor of Isandwana. Incidentally, Cochrane had taken over the post from his father. There were also changes in the Cape Mounted Rifles, the CMR. CMR was divided now into two wings, left wing and right wing. Left wing was commanded by Colonel Zach Bailey, the man that carried Morosi's mount in 1879 wearing his deerstalker hat. And right wing was commanded by Colonel Fred Carrington of the 24th Foot, the man who had actually formed and raised the Frontier Light Horse, as well as two other mounted infantry squadrons. The CMR also received as senior NCOs and drill instructors a number of 17th Lancers, and this was on the advice of Carrington, in fact. They also had, for the first time, the appointment of Regimental Sergeant Major. There are a number of other men that were former Zulu War veterans that came across as commissioned officers directly into the CMR. CMR actually used to have men being promoted from the ranks, and, and this was a first, there was this large influx, and this was men like Shervington of the NNC, the Tel Native contingent had been recommended by Victoria Cross at Ashawi, Darcy, um, Cecil Darcy, who had been awarded the Victoria Cross for, um, with the Frontier Light Horse, F.W. Bryce, who was an NNC officer, and then Tim Lucan, who was also a Natal Native pioneer man and Natal Native contingent of being wounded at Lalundi. Many other Zulu War veterans had applied for commissions in the CMR, but failing to get these, they accepted to go into the ranks, and they didn't come in at, at a sergeant level. They come in as um, second or third class privates. The Cape Mounted Yeomanry, that had been raised just before the Morosi Rebellion and took to the field during that that war um, with poorly equipped, no uniforms, and and leaving with a mixed reputation. The, the third yeomanry left with a very, very poor reputation. Um, the first and second yeomanry, um, probably in that order, the first and second had the better reputations. They've now been refitted, they're uniformed out, they've got standardised weapons across the board, they've all got Snyders, and they're feeling better about themselves, they've got more training days under their belt, and plus they've got some Zulu war talent come in. The third yeomanry that had lost their adjutant, Captain Darville, who was basically sacked, they received now um, Captain Christian, a former Imperial officer had recently been serving with the Frontier Light Horse in the Zulu War. So he comes in as her adjutant and that regiment starts to turn around. Then you've got Colonel Griffith. Okay, Griffith is still the government agent in Basutu land. Um, he led the forces originally down to Morosi Mountain and directed the first failed assault at the, at the mountain. He's up in Maseru at the outbreak of the um, the gun war, along with Colonel Bailey and about 300 men of the CMR. So as moms, ladies and gents, I just want to interrupt Cam for one second 
to say please do check the description for this show for links to his books on Amazon. And also please do consider signing up for my mailing list over at redcoathistory.com slash newsletter. When you do that you'll get a free book from me all about the Battle of Isandwana. On top of that you'll get a monthly or bi-weekly email with updates about good stories from military history, my latest videos and other things I've seen from around the internet. All right, guys, let's get back to Cam. Thanks. Now, the actual gun war kicks off. The shooting war starts on the 13th September 1880. But as far back as July, there was a number of preparations going. In Mafeting itself, the resident magistrate, Arthur Barclay, who was formerly of the 6th Dragoons and had also distinguished himself at Morosi's Mountain, he'd started the fortified courthouse um, and, the, and the store rooms as well in anticipation of what they felt then was an imminent attack by Leratoli. He placed tarpaulins um, over the roof of the courthouse so it couldn't catch fire, possibly a lessons learned from Rock Stripped. He had with him eight Europeans of which four were old soldiers and 20 Basudu police at that stage and they but the, however they did have plenty of ammunition for those men so his force was very small. Um, close by at um, Dippering, there was a trading store that was owned by Mr. David Fraser. And Fraser had 30 men with him. And they just refer to this store as Fraser's store. Now, during this period, although it was believed that Basuto war rituals were beginning, Leratoli actually remained very amicable in um, this period, whilst it was described as a period of great suspense and they were in anticipating that there would be an attack against them. Up north um, on the 1st of September, um, Chief Masufa, a, a brother of Letsi, had mobilised his um, regiments and concentrated them around Maseru and um, essentially had surrounded Maseru, which he finally attacked on the 10th of October. At Mahali's Hoak, Sprig had paid attention to the hope that was um, very weakly defended. And as early as 3rd of September, he'd written some instructions that he felt that this is the way that we need to defend Mahali's Hope and Mahali's Hope must be defended. He finally concluded and said, this is just my thoughts, but this is a military matter and, and I'll leave it to the soldiers. But however, his advice actually was quite good in, in what he was proposing of getting them better support. It wasn't heeded though. Carrington at this stage had 200 men of the CMR um, marching out of Coxstad towards Morosi's country. But when they're on the line of march, this is later changed to orders of you must march to Mafeting. So after all this tension, this kind of a phony war. Come the 13th of September, Carrington's sitting on the Free State border. The Cape forces haven't been given permission to march in to Vepina and stage themselves at Mason's Farm. And they're ready to cross into Basutu land and support Barclay at Mafeting. The Basutu have got 5,000 men in the field between Mafeting and the border at this stage. However, they're not all visible. They're sitting in low land, waiting to see what's going to transpire. Carrington's got with him 200 men and 23 wagons full of supplies. And he's formed up with a troop on each flank and also front and rear. So when he advances in, he would have his forward screen out. But he's also riding in in a defensive position defensive formation I should say ready to fight in case they're they're attacked. Early in this day Barclay rides out from Mafeting and he meets Leratoli who had with him about 300 men at that stage. They meet as friends and Barclay pleads with him in his words to try and save him from the utter, utter destruction if possible meaning you don't want to go into rebellion against the Cape forces. Barclay suggests that he surrenders and receives a fine 
which it agreed to, but only if the policies were stopped, meaning the disarmament policies of you know that was going to be stopped of which Barclay has no control over authorization to um, make an agreement on and he just Barclay explains to him that that's just not possible and it's not going to happen so it's imminently about to start this shooting war as the CMR are patrolling in they then meet Barclay and Barclay warns Carrington of the possible forces that are laying ahead against them as they've now crossed uh, across the Free State border into Basutu land. Garrington's then approached by three of Leratoli's men who order him to turn back, of which Carrington, you can imagine with this man with this massive Warris moustache, you know, says the effect, no, I'm coming in, and he spurs on. The Basutu start to appear on the high ground in and around them in increasing numbers and they're about two miles out of Maffetine and there's 600 men now with Leratoli out on the road and that further 700 on the field. The Basuto fire the first shots of which one goes over the head of Barclay. The CMR at this stage are ordered not to return fire. This is ineffective fire. Then it gets to about 30 shots are starting to land closely in around them and it's just Carrington then orders his men to storm the nearest copy which they take. The Basutu return fire and then in that commando style um, tactic they retire they no intention of standing and losing a, a number of men it was it was a pointless exercise so they retire back to the, the next hill and Carrington um, is with the um, the main body of the CMR and then he orders some of the native police to charge the, the Basuto at the next batch of Basuto they find at the gallop the Basuto stop a further several times to rally and block the CMR put down fire and then when the CMR get close once again they retire. It, it was said that there was about five Basutu killed and Laratoli's horse was wounded at this stage and this is by the, the account of the Barclay left. They finally arrive into Maffeting where they lager up and immediately Carrington pushes out into the field a number of patrols. During the course of the day, Sergeant James Swift of uh, the Cape Mounted Rifles, who was a former Royal Artilleryman and had also been a, a civil conductor in the transport and commissariat during the Langavilly Valley Rebellion in 73, he's wounded when he's out on a patrol uh, about a mile out of Maffeting. He's, he's shot in the um, right calf. Um, six other CMR had their horses wounded. However, a Private Henry Bracken's horse broke away during one of the engagements and he lost his horse and his equipment, everything on his horse to the enemy. He later puts in a compensation claim. That's how we find out about that little nugget of information. Barclay wrote in his report, he called this the Battle of Maffeting, hardly a battle. It, it, it was nothing more but a um, little bit of a military posturing, patrolling, um, some few skirmishes. In total, it was believed that there were 10, a total in, after the day's patrolling, a total of 10 Basudu were killed, including one of the sons of Letsi. Um, and so ended the Battle of Maffeting, as um, Barclay called. So a few days after, Carrington arrives in Maffeting on the 15th September, he sends a patrol out to Masopa's Corral that ends up being um, cleared and levelled. Um, Lieutenant Carstenton and um, a Lieutenant Theo Clark, um, each with 20, 25 CMR, leave in two directions to execute this order. It's inter interesting at this point in time that um, Clark manages to get himself lost. Carstenton gets in and he's holding the crow by himself 
and it's decided that you know they're going to re retire so they're not really becoming fully acquainted of the ground that's surrounding them and out of this um the rsm's present this is rsm george lalfer who was a former royal artillery gentleman ranker and also served with the 17th lancers um he has a fall from his horse and um, has a contusion of the head um he's the only casualty of the day um interesting enough lalfer his real name was graves and he later declares this when he's commissioned in the um, CMR and also becomes a British South Africa company man. Then two days after this, Captain Shervington, he takes 40 CMR out on a recce of a village um, two miles from Mafeting. And as he moves into the, um, the village where they're hoping to secure a lot of grain that they realise that the Basuvo have been moving into this village, all of a sudden he finds himself surrounded by about 700 men, they estimated, under Leratoli. And they're supported by a further 600 other men that are um, not far off and hiding in a, um, a dip in the ground. So the CMR coming under fire form a defensive position in this village. They weren't expecting this, that's for sure. They thought they were going to come in here, drive the Basuto away, secure the grain. They weren't expecting that they're going to um, be hemmed in here at this village. So they're in this position and they're fighting back as best they can. Carrington sees what's going on and he sends um, Lieutenant Theo Clark and George McMullen with 15 men each out to support them. Carrington himself then decides to follow on with 30 men. Clark manages to boldly charge a line of Basutu and drove them back and he created this opening in the Basutu line and Shervington able to see this opportunity quickly mounts his men up and they managed to, to charge through this hole in the Basutu line it was created by Clark. Um, McMullen himself is out with his 15 men and as bold as ever um, McMullen's as a tough character. Um, he was the man that was reputedly the second man up on Morosi's mountain. He was a tough man that meted out discipline in the CMR with his fists. An actual fact, at one point in time, he was under arrest at Morosi's mountain for knocking out one of his men on the line of march. So McMullen's got his guys in the field, 15 against 400 Basutu. Um, they're putting down as much fire as they can to cover um, Shervington and, and Clark. But during this retirement, um, Clark dashes out to the assistance of a wounded man and he's killed along with two others um, during this fight. Um, it, it, that was the end, end of Clark. Um, he was a farmer's son from Lincolnshire and had been in the Frontier Arm out of police. He first joined as a private back in 1874 so it's quite a tragic end to the brave um, Lieutenant Clark but however they they don't bring in the grain and they're starting to see that the pursuit are, are really going to pin them in down around Mafeting here and at this stage they're realizing the door is really shut on them you know these large forces of um, Basutu commandos are operating around Mafeting. So we've talked a lot about Mafeting. Now let's switch our attention to Mahali's Hoke. Come 20th September 1880, this is when the shooting war starts in Mahali's Hoke, although like at Mafeting, there's this build up and a, and a lot of tension going on in the area. So Mahali's Hoke, or the Cornet Sprite Magistracy, um, in southern Basuto land, close to Morosi's old country. It's defended from the 20th of September 1880 by the resident magistrate, William Sermon. He was formerly an officer of the Frontier Arm Mounted Police, and he'd also served as commandant of a Basuto contingent at the Morosi's um, Rebellion um, the previous year. He's got with him 13 Europeans and 110 native police, which was a mixture of um, Fengu and loyal Basutu. His brother James is also there as well. So the primary buildings that they're defending at the Hoke 
is the residency, courthouse, prison, government stables and the St John's Church, which was under the Reverend John Stenson, who was the son of Reverend Edmund Stenson, formerly of the 41st Foot, and who was at that point in time in Vepina. Um, Edmund later became chaplain to the forces in Basutu land. So in this position, they're, they're extremely vulnerable, very small numbers. Um, they're, you know, they're really faced by between 1,500, 2,000 Basutu that are mustering in the area around them. Um, warnings of the hope being attack, attacked have been received for um, weeks now. Um, they fortified these buildings with four principal sangers um, built around the courthouse mainly and that was manned by the Basuto police. Even back in August 1880 um, these small band of Europeans formed themselves as Mahali's Hope European Volunteers which was under the resident magist magistrates clerk um, Lieutenant William Carlyle also a frontier arm man a policeman a former one that is and um, just a handful in number. Needless to say, the regimental um, reunions would be very small with that number, but good on them. They're doing the best they can. A little bit further afield um, in Aliwal, Aliwal North, um, Captain Joseph Parker, who commanded E Troop of the Second Cape Mounted Yeomanry, he was possibly the, the closest force to them at that stage. He took the initiative and he managed to bring in to um into the hoke in the earlier days um a number of rifles and 700 rounds of ammunition and powder and it was said also about that point that they had food to last them for about a month um in the distance visual distance at oliphant's beam across in the free state um there was a cape mounted yeomanry camp there that later the um CMR also um, moved in and occupied as well um, and they had line of sight then across the border. Um, so the Basudu attacked the garrison at the Hoke on the afternoon of the, the 20th September. Um, while there had been a number of warnings that day, um, cattle and horses were still out grazing and it was thought to be a non-event that the attack wasn't going to come in. And then all of a sudden, somebody yells out, here they come. And the Basuda were coming in on all directions. Um, when about 700 yards from the courthouse, the defenders opened fire. And the, the, the firing lasts for about an hour and a half in, the, in this first attack. Attempts were made to get in and burn the, um, the church. Also, um, firing from the, the courthouse um, suppressed any attempt to do this. So these sangers were very well placed. Um, the Basudu got away with 500 cattle that had been out grazing and a number of the native police horses. Um, they took a lot of, also took away a lot of material, including um, personal equipment, um, saddles, etc. Um, we know this because there was this appears in a number of reports and also some compensa compensation claims that come in later on. And after this one and a half hour um, firefight, sniping continues for the remainder of the day. Interesting enough, um, Octavius um, Balco, who's age 65 at the time, um, James Sermon and Edward Hancock, a couple of the Europeans, are, are mentioned by Sermon for exceptional bravery, as he calls it. Now, they said that Bowker was a deadly shot um, and that anybody got within a few hundred yards of him wasn't going to get any further. He, he was that good. And he was the brother of Commandant Bowker, who'd formerly commanded the Frontier Arm Mounted Police. Um, Hancock was working at that point with the native police and doing really good work. The Reverend Stenson, um, he was present throughout and although he was, he was fighting, um, he was described as being another um, 
Chaplain Smith like a Rourke's Drift Bane in handing out ammunition and um, tending to the wounded. A first class private um, Rabbit Swana of the Basuto Police um, is singled out by Sermon and he said he behaved splendidly throughout and who in the Monday's attack sallied out with about five men and dislodged some rebel sharpshooters who were causing us great annoyance um, at about 400 yards off. Total casualties with that day were very small, one killed and one wounded. Um, they said that Basudu had considerable loss under the weight of fire put down on them. So following the attack on Mahali's Oak on the 20th, the, um, at the same time Carrington had, had sent out a patrol towards Leratoli's Corral, just outside Mafeting, and he realised that he'd been heavily reinforced, so he returns to Mafeting and confirms his defences and orders his men that if they are to be attacked, they're to control their fire, there should be no wastage of ammunition at all. And it's the following day on the 21st of September um, at 10.45 that Leratoli puts in an attack against Maffetang and Fraser's store. And the first phase of it is he manages to come in and secure the cattle, the cattle which is the slaughter cattle, which is what they're living off every day. And they also managed to drive off the Basuto um, police horses. The CMR horses they managed to save. Um, and this is the first part of the attack. And then what happens next is a charge from all sides against Mafeting. And at about 400 yards out, as the Basuto are coming in, they're... Um, the colonial forces are putting down a heavy fire. They first then managed to capture 20 European styled houses, which was a native village, um, four to 500 yards out of um, Mafeting. They then put in another charge against this entrenched position. And there's at least 10 Basutu killed at this stage. And dismounting, they managed to um, get into a deep sloot and behind a sod wall that they start the loophole to put in fire against the government forces. There's a mounted another mounted charge that, that comes in led by a um, chief and this one gets to within a hundred yards of the courthouse and it's stopped in its tracks and their, their brave leaders shot and the colonial forces at this stage are a, a little bit stunned by <laughs> this reckless bravery uh, of the Basutu. And there's great concern at this point in time that how are we going to stop more of these charges coming in? It's different coming in on foot, but mounted charges is different, especially the weight and number that is, is with them. And next there's this bold 1500 Basutu then managed to um, charge in along the road and they get to win 400 yards of the colonial defences and they're checked by a, a heavy, heavy and concentrated fire. A lot of these men retire taking away the dead and the wounded with them but what was described by Carrington himself as the boldest of these men kept going. And they manage to get in through the defences and they get themselves into a position um, in a garden that's overlooked by the Sanger positions. So this Sanger positions not only got a Basuto firing line in front of it, they've now got Basuto behind them as well, but they can overlook into it, you see. And these men, probably numbering about 250 at that stage, are reinforced by subsequent Basutu charges that manage to get in and get themselves into behind these sod walls that they're also loophole and some relative cover. They've got a lot of horses in there with themselves that also manage to become casualties. Leratoli at this stage, um, one of his horses is um, he's shot from under him during the charges. Now, Carrington at this point manages to send out reinforcement, ammunition and water to Barclay's house and to 
the idea there is so they're going to hold that his intent is so i need to get supplies through them so we can hold this force that's being penned down by this force that they do say at one stage is numbering about five five hundred basutu but more likely about 350 to 400 basutu that managed to get into this this garden area behind the sod wall carrington he's got ammunition out to everybody he's he's gone up himself and he's met with barclay and he decides at this point that they've got to regain the initiative whilst their outer defenses are really holding um, he knows he's got to drive these pursuit out of out of this garden area and close at hand is captain sherbenton and he gives him very quick orders that is to grab as many men as he can and launch a mounted charge into the garden area and he's got within 25 men and they um, they move out at the canter to um, drive these these men out and one of the guys that was with him um, sergeant harry woon you know he says at this point they only had time to put the bridles on their horses they rode bareback and they carried pistols and in CMR folklore this pistol charge was well known it was referred to as Sherbenton's pistol charge and for many years later uh, it had been discussed and in the 30s it's a, it's even debated did they have rifles pistols or not um, but Harry Woon that was there said they carried pistols and of course it's for they they call it the pistol charge so hastily they charge on in the basudu in the garden are also under fire from the reverse of the sanger positions up on the, the hill to the right of them also barclays putting down fire onto them as well so they're in a real tight corner here and very very quickly they're driven out um, the charge is a complete success. Shervington had orders not to pursue them because Carrington knew that the Basutu um, reserve was lurching around and he didn't want them to go out too far. But however, as the Basutu are retiring, they're, um, they're coming under incredible weight of fire. And one man that was up in the Sangers, um, overlooking all this and one, presumably one of the men that was putting in the um the covering fire and then also firing on the basutu as they were retiring it was a private harry eve of the cmr that witnessed this and he said years later that he could see Shervington was just wearing his shirt sleeve riding breeches and top boots but he was carrying his sword crossways in his mouth and his revolver in his right hand firing as he's charging in. I mean, sword crossways in your mouth, that's almost like Errol Flynn stuff. Um, but but quite incredible. But with a man like Sherbenton, you know, anything's possible. And you believe it, this is a man that was recommended for Victoria Cross during the defence of Ashawi in the Zulu War. Anyway, so the Basutu, as they're retiring, we're... we're attempting to move as many of their dead and wounded as possible um, the colonials later counted 59 dead horses in around that garden area and where the charge had come in and where they'd been driven out they found um, eight dead basutu near a, um, a sod wall um, that they'd been firing through having loopholed it earlier the um, basuto reserve had moved in and helped carry away a, a lot of the, the dead and wounded as well. And Carrington later could never really um, come with a figure. In actual fact, he said, we got no idea how many um, Basutu were killed. There's some estimates in the day's fighting, there were several hundred, um, quite possibly several hundred all told, wounded included. Um, the defences themselves had really held out um barclay and Shervington both commented that um, lieutenant carstenson's defenses this is that prussian officer um serving with the cmr 
um, with his brother in the ranks, as we mentioned earlier, um, the defences that Carstenden had built um, really, really saved the day. They said that was the deciding factor, that their defences were, were spot on. There's a, approximately um, five men wounded, um, no none killed on the on the side of the colonials. Um, there's six others slightly wounded. The most severe um, casualty is Sergeant Labana. The Basudo police had a, received a gunshot wound to the head. A Corporal Wallace Brownlow, um, he's he's wounded. Brownlow, incidentally enough, was a um, old naval brigade man from the Zulu War, and uh, incidentally, he was became a a well-known baritone singer at, at America and, and um, in England, and he's out in Australia in 1919, and he's found in Melbourne with his throat cut, um, a, a grisly ending to um, old Brownlow, who later in the gun war, he, gun war is actually commissioned. Um, several others, including John Bevan and William Curran, who are both former 17th Lancers men. So that ends the this fighting at the um, at Mafeting on the 21st, the firing goes right into the night. Um, and immediately after, a Lieutenant Montague, who was one of the troop commanders, had volunteered to um, carry dispatches across to the Free State, the Mason's Farm, where Clark's forces are, are being slowly building up. And he does this a number of times, um, very, very dangerous as all around them, the pursuit who were over every hill. That's quite incredible, really. So at Mahali's Hoke on the 25th September, the second attack comes in. And this one was to last four hours. And, it, and it's in the evening, it's 8pm. And um, William Sermon and his brother James, they're sort of feeling that something's not right. The atmospherics are changing in the area. And... Um, they move about 200 yards away from the, um, what they were calling then as the fort, um, to Sermon's house and just to do a bit of preparation to, and to prevent it from being um, burnt down. And they get there and they're in the house and at the same time about 40 Basutu had moved into the garden and um, a Basuto appears at the window and James Sermon at a, at a range of 10 yards kills one with a shotgun and then more Basutu start to emerge out of the garden to attack them and um, William Sherman um, shoots another one down and at this stage the two of them put down such a heavy weight of fire that the Basutu break and um, clear off and then the, the Sermons manage to get themselves back down to the, the fort around the courthouse and um, then at 9pm a large force, and it was estimated about 1,500 plus. It's dark at this stage, um, and they're believing that it was excessive to 1,500, I should say, um, Basuto that started to attack them from all sides. And it's quite a determined attack, this one. Um, they managed to get in and burn the mission house, and next thing, the residency and government stables go up in flames as well. And it was said, as cool as ever, and um, always cool and steady under fire was um, what then he was appointed Lieutenant Hancock, that is. Um, and he he was with his pursuit to um, police and that they're putting down a heavy weight of fire against the attack. Um, and they managed to, to actually stem this determined assault and it ends up with 50 dead Basuto in front of their defensive positions. But the attacks keep coming and coming, and it's Hancock and these um, Basutu and the Mafengu um, police that are with them as well um, managed to stop this attack. Incredibly, only sustain one casualty, whilst it, there's numerous um, Basutu casualties in this four-hour firefight. And however, at this point in time, they realise they're starting to run really low on ammunition and things are looking pretty perilous for them at Mahali's Hoke. If there's another determined attack in, it's going to fold and they'll probably all end up getting um, wiped out at the Hoke. So following the night attack at Mahali's Hoke on the 25th, over at Oliphant's Bean, 
with the buildings going up in flames, the CMR and Yeomanry Detachment could clearly see this. And they realise that they've got to relieve these guys. And with this messenger that's running the gauntlet with the messages in his boot, word gets across that they're running dangerously low on ammunition. And something's got to be done. So the initiative's taken. They've got to get in and they've got to relieve Mahali's hope quickly. So this takes place on the 4th of October, and which is a pretty dashing affair, really. Um, but the day prior, on the 3rd of October, we've got Colonel Southey of the 2nd Yeomanry, commanding the 2nd Yeomanry, arrives and meets with Major Grant of the, the CMR. And these guys knew each other well. They'd fought side by side in that Morosi's Rebellion in, in 1879. And natural fact, in the first assault on the mountain, when Major Grant, um, then a captain, with his men were stuck up against that defensive wall. Help came in the form of the second yeomanry under Southey. So they had a lot of great trust with each other, these men. Southey, although an imperial officer, had been born out in the Cape and he came back out. He was a 10th foot man, came back out in 1878 as a special um, service officer. And then they appointed him to command the second yeomanry. Um, with him arriving at this stage, um, was Captain Edward Cooper, who is his new adjutant. And um, Cooper was formerly an officer in the 34th Foot. He'd served in the ranks of the Frontier Round Manor Police, went down and joined Pauline's Rangers in the Ninth Frontier War, and commanded as a commandant the 2nd, 3rd Natal Native Contingent in the Zulu War. So there was a good team being put together here. Now, Southie quickly discussed with Grant, who knew this ground intimately. He'd been patrolling out to the border, and his men also knew from this runner coming through the best route to go and more, the most likely places where the Basutu were going to gather to stop them from relieving the Hoke. Southie listens to Grant's plan, and he approves it. And it agrees that, you know, this is the right course of action. And they're going to go the next day on the 4th of October. So of his force here, he's got of his second yeomanry, 14 officers and 199 men. He's got um, Major Grant along with Darcy VC and a composite force of men from the 2nd, 3rd and 5th troops of the CMR. Nine officers and 167 men. Um, there's a couple of smaller groups, um, local volunteers, Hunt Sally will volunteers, as they're called, one officer and seven men under the command of um, a former um, British Army um, officer, Captain um, John Hunt. Also, there's what they call Sprig Zone Border um, Rifle Volunteers, from also from Aliwal, 28 men under a Lieutenant Roxburgh. They've got a, a single nine pounder gun of the Cape Field Artillery, which is formerly the um, the artillery troop of the CMR. They're taking with them two empty wagons and with ammunition only. And the idea of the wagons is to recover any assets and to transport any wounded that um, manage to um, um, evolve during the course of the, um, the subsequent fight. And they know that they're going in for a fight as well. Um, each man's carrying 24 hours of cooked rations with them and 100 rounds of ammunition on their body. So at 4 a.m. they parade, everybody's mounted, and they move off in this mobile um, square formation with all flanks being covered. And the vanguard out front is commanded by Captain Cecil Darcy, VC, with 30 CMR, some Hunts volunteers, and um, Captain Joseph Parker's um, second yeomanry troop. And incidentally enough, um, Parker's yeomanry troop, um, they were in that first assault at Morosi's Mountain also, and they were closely supporting um, Grant, and Grant trusted Parker, you know, to the end of the earth. He, was gonna, he, would, he would soldier alongside Parker. That's how much he thought of this man. So... They're crossing down at the um, drift at the um, Makaleng River 
I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And they cross without any opposition. They've got eight miles to go um, from the beam across the border. And um, to um, Mahali's hope, that is, after one mile, one mile in, they start to receive a few rounds that have been fired at extended distances. Then pretty soon afterwards, um, a Basuto force starts to block their way and the vanguard becomes hotly engaged, as was written in the report. Um, Darcy forms a firing line and a heavy firefight does break out. The um, Cape forces have two men killed and 11 wounded, of which nine of them are seriously wounded. One of these men was actually a, um, a former Frontier Light Horseman, um, Trooper Nightingale, or Private Nightingale, I should say, of the CMR, who um, Darcy said behaved with the greatest gallantry. Um, now, Nightingale, badly wounded, was put into the wagons with the, the other men, and the, the, there's no chance of turning back. They've got to keep going. They're committed now. They've got to fight their way through to the Hoke. Captain Parker at this stage, um, he moves off to a flank where 300 Basutu try to um, drive in from a flank and, and press against the uh, main convoy itself. And with his troop, they managed to force these, these men away. Um, Southey said um, at this point that he was really happy at the conduct of the men and the, and the way against these, these odds of the men against them. They were holding their own and he, he singled out and he said um, Darcy and Parker who by their dash dislodged the enemy from the position they had taken up relieving the main body guarding the wagons, wagons from the shower of lead that had been falling amongst them and with this force blocking them in front driven away Darcy and Parker are the first into the hoke and as they arrived at at um, in at the Hoke itself, and they said the cheers were just going up everywhere. The garrison was so relieved um, just to see these men arriving that they mainly maybe only knew a few of them personally, um, but they didn't didn't care. They were they were being finally relieved. Um, the main force comes in, and there's no time to hang around. The order is load up any casualties they've got any government assets that needed to be recovered and any men from the garrison that could not move out on foot swiftly because the garrison was predominantly on foot at this stage. We're going to have to move with them on, on foot as infantry to get in the wagons. And they've got these couple of wagons, you see. So not hanging around. And at 11 a.m., they move off as quick as they can back to the border. And they get three miles out from the drift and they know that they're going to be attacked. And 400 Basutu manage to appear off to a flank and A&E troops of the Second Yeomanry, um, they, they form up and they leave what um, Southie said was a brilliant charge. And then the CMR also um, move up onto the high ground to support the column that finally pushes through and they're back at the Free State border at 2 a.m. So 16 miles have been covered, two fights in 11 hours. Um, like Carrington's earlier report, Southie said it was impossible to state the Basutu casualties. that They weren't hanging around to count them. Um, but that was the end of it. The Mahali's Hoke was relieved. Um, William Sermon and his Basutu police and that small band of Europeans had for this 15 day, days held out two determined attacks and continual um, sniping against them and they're really running low on in, in ammunition. They were not going to survive another attack, that's for sure. So just prior to the relief of Mafeting itself on the 4th of October, Veratoli decides he's going to attack Fraser's store. It's outside the defences of Mafeting and it's vulnerable. 
and see so puts about 3,000 men against this as a, the day builds up and so it really kicks off with several hundred Basutu moving forward and they start to engage the forces around the store which is obviously um, Fraser's men and this um, 15 odd CMR that are there supporting Fraser's store and firing starts to build up then Leratoli sends more reinforcements up they're putting a ring around the store to cut it off there's also blocking forces out as well knowing that the response is going to be to send um, forces out from Mafeting as well so you've got about 3,000 men out in the field at this stage now as the forces start to build up around Fraser's store they manage, the Basutu managed to capture a number of the buildings at the main store itself, which is heavily loopholed. There are actually some blind spots. And so in these blind spots, that enabled the Basutu to get very, very close up to the store. And about three in the afternoon, 50 CMR and Basutu police under the command of Barclay are sent out by Carrington to demonstrate. However, the Basutu managed to push them back. And with ever increasing um, Basutu forces gathering, it's decided by Carrington that he's going to withdraw everybody for the night and then he'll deal with the situation in the morning. Now, for the whole night, the fighting continues around Fraser's store. Not intense, but it's sporadic fighting and it's breaking out. Then the following morning, it's decided that... Um, he put this force out, but firstly, he he puts together a, a team of men under a Lieutenant George Russ, who's a former sergeant of the Tenth of Sars, and a, also like many of them, a former Frontier Arm Mounted Policeman. With ten men and two pack horses loaded up with ammunition, and his orders are to break through the Basuto defences and get to Fraser's store with this um, this ammunition, and he's um, ten men. And this he does. He manages a very, very brave men. They manage to, to fight their way through and they get through. Then Captain Shervington and 25 men armed with long sniders, not the carbines in this case, went out and they were putting, they established a firing line and they're putting down a real heavy fire against the nearest Basuto firing line um, that they could get up to. And at this this point, the Basutu know that Carrington's going to respond by sending more, more men out and rather than sustain heavy casualties, they just very, very calmly start to withdraw. And it, it said even some of the Basuto just walked off, you know. Um, it was quite remarkable. So um, this attack started as a progression of a few men coming forward and firing, built up to this 3,000. And then Leratoli just collapsed it. They demonstrated, um, they came in and that they showed that the, the Cape forces that we're still out here and we can still fight. Then um, after that, um, 4th of October in East Griqualand um, at Matateli, the um, Basutu go into rebellion out there and the civil servants flee into um, Coxstad. So the gun war is starting to spread now. Um, Maseru was attacked um, on the ninth, the night of the 9th and 10th of October. A number of building, buildings are burnt, um, but the Basuto are, are driven off there. And it's at this stage that um, Brigadier General Clark is mustering a very large force together at Mason's Farm near Vepina, ready to come in and relieve Mafeting. So on the 16th of October, Clark arrives at Mason's farm. When he gets here, he takes command of the combined forces that have been mustering under numerous commanders at the time of various seniority. So here he's got um, the CMR, roughly about 200 men under um, Major Grant and Darcy VC, the men that have relieved Mahali's Hoke. He's got... Um, 17 men and two guns of the Cape Field Artillery, 
all three regiments of the uh, Cape Yeomanry are, are represented. The first Yeomanry have got 340 men under um, Edward Brabant. Um, Brabant, you recall, was an old Imperial CMR man and he commanded for a while at Morosi's Mountain and sadly went away um, with broken health. He sort of ran himself into the ground and was suffering from insomnia out of that. But however, extremely good operator. You've got Richard Southey, the man that um, with his second yeomanry um, led the forces to go in to relieve Mahali's Hoke. And then you've got 140 men of the third yeomanry under um, Colonel Tom Minto. Um, Tom Minto was a man that emerged with a um, slightly shattered reputation after um, the Morosi Rebellion. Um, and however, in the, in the gun war, he manages to um, claw that back. Um, now, we've got also got some men from um, the Diamond Fields up um, the Kimberley Horse, 200 men under um, Major Stanley Lowe. Um, Hunt's volunteers that were also in the um, relief of Mahali's Noak is now roughly about 50 men. Sermon, Magistrate Sermon, is now Captain Sermon and his combined force um, from Mahali's Hope that, that took part in the defence is now known as the Mahali's Hope Contingent and they're also in the field. Major Deer with Prince Alfred's Volunteer Guard um, from Port Elizabeth, there's 175 of the men, of those men. Um, Captain David Sampson, a veteran frontier fighter, has got 78 men from the first city of Grahamstown Volunteer Rifles. And then from Cape Town, we've got 300 men of the Duke of Edinburgh's own Volunteer Rifles under a Captain Edward um, Windus, who was formerly a, a sergeant or a colour sergeant, I should say, in the 86 foot. They've got with them also 40 wagons of supplies and equipment and also enough room to pick up any casualties that they're going to sustain on the way in to relieve Mafeting because they are expecting a fight and they're going to get one as well. So it's 6am on the morning of 19th of October 1880 Clark leads his column across the border to relieve Mafferty. Got about 10 miles to go. He's got his 40 wagons in the centre. They've got mounted troops on all flanks and the vanguards led by about 50 men of the, the first Cape Mounted Yeomanry. Immediately following up in the rear, he's got the third Yeomanry and the, the Diamond Fields men of the Kimberley Horse. When they get to Calabani Mountain, on the road into Mafeting, it's about four miles along. There's a ridge running off to the left. Building up in this area, there was a force of about, it was estimated to be about seven to 8,000 mounted Basutu. And whilst that had several shots fired them from the left flank as they're coming on in, Clark orders six troops at the first yeomanry to move up onto this ridge and clear it and believing that there were boot pursuited behind it to drive them away. As these men approach this ridge, rather than riding up and seeing what was on the other side of it still mounted, they dismounted just prior to it and then moved on foot up to the crest of the ridge. At that point in time, Leratoli pounced on their mistake and a large pursuit force charged in. And in a matter of minutes, not talking 15 minutes, 30 minutes, several minutes, the pursuit armed with battle axes, predominantly using their battle axes, killed 32 Cape Yeomanry and mortally wounded a further 10 others. Two CMR are also casualties um, on this field that day as well. Captain Nettleton, commanding G Troop, which took the brunt of this fighting, he managed to save four men. Captain Leach with his troop, they managed to rally and drive the Basuto away, leaving about, we left about 40 to 50 um, killed on the field. Another G troop man, Corporal McLean, a, a first yeomanry man, of course, 
Um, he behaved exceptionally well during this fight. I mean, he rallied his men and um, was instrumental along with Leach in driving the Basuto away. Interesting enough that had this been the Zulu War, Nettleton, Leach and McLean probably would have received the Victoria Cross. However, they just received a mention. McLean also, um, at the time of the um, Anglo-Boer War, was a lieutenant colonel at that stage. Braben, who commanded the 1st Yeomanry, he's out in front with Clark. Now, he wasn't aware, incredibly, that this was his men that had gone into action. The first he, he learns of this is when a young 16-year-old lad carried in the arms of his father is carried to the ambulance wagon. These two men have been serving side by side as troopers in G Troop. Then Captain Nettleton, who commanded the troop, gallops up to Brabant and with tears in his eyes, and actually he burst into tears in front of Brabant, he stops and says, my troop's been destroyed. The shock of this attack and the amount of casualties inflicted in such a short time clearly stunned Clark and Brabant and needless to say others around him. The attacks didn't stop. A further three to four hundred Basuto then charged on the right flank and a number of men under Lieutenant Stevens of the Duke of Edinburgh's own and under the Dukes sallied out alongside 50 of the second Cape Mounted Yeomanry managed to stop this attack. It was noticed at this point in time that these men, some of them were wearing the uniforms of the first Cape Yeomanry, so they had enough time to remove them. They picked up their casualties. They didn't dwell. They didn't proceed out and clear that ground any further. They kept the momentum up of the march and kept pushing on in. The casualties were thrown into a wagon and it was a real melancholy sight as they relieved Mafeking, but bringing in all their dead and wounded were these flopping men, their lifeless bodies flopping in this wagon. It was very, very upsetting for men like Brabant and as soon as they got in, they set to having a funeral for these men. Having reached Mafeking at about one o'clock in the afternoon, needless to say, Carrington and Barclay were elated to see them. They'd been reduced to eating horse flesh, of which they even offered them horse flesh um, dinner, which they, they declined. They conducted the funeral and then they set to preparing themselves for subsequent operations. That was the relief of Mafeking, but marked by that incredible disaster at Calabani. So that's the defence and relief of Mafeting and Mahali's Hoke. Wasn't the end of the gun war. Of course, rebellion then broke out in East Griqualan and the Transkei. And at the height of the fighting, the colonial forces had with 16,000 colonials and native levies, including burghers, in the field at any one point up for the next six months. The mobilisation was quite incredible. Several regiments had actually been changed out. Relief detachments had been sent because a lot of the men were volunteers. They all needed to go home and return to their jobs. The Basutu... In Basuto land itself remained highly mobile. The colonial forces could never pin them down, could never really get out of Mafeting without a fight. They ended up moving camps slightly northwards. But when they're in these camps, they're bogged down. Even to go out and collect firewood would need a whole regiment. You know, they'd send like the third yeomanry would be tasked to go collect firewood. It, it, it was incredible. I mean, they were just bogged down always. Bad weather also impeded the movement. It was never a war that they were going to win. The Basuto would never allow themselves to be decisively beaten on a battlefield, which the colonial forces wanted. At the end of the day, an armistice was declared on the 18th of April, 1881, where operations were suspended, the chief suspended operations. 
you know, what one Basudo actually said that the gun war just evaporated overnight. It was there one moment and it was gone the next. There are even discussions, like um, Rabbit even talks himself about he met a chief um, immediately after the armistice and they got on really well. Um, they had a lot of great conversations and he said before he left Basuto land, he wanted to secure a really good Basuto pony. So he exchanges a pony with him for an officer's mess dress uniform that um, Brabant had bought in and obviously was never going to wear there. Um, so almost immediately they were on amicable terms. Brabant talked highly of Leratoli, um, who was his main adversary around at that stage. During the course of the war, Carrington was wounded and he was out of action. Shervington took charge of the, um, took command of the um, Cape Mounted Rifles from him when he was out and he only returned about 18 months later or something like that. The gun war destroyed the Sprig Ministry. Um, in May 1881, he was voted out having spent £2 million on this needless war. At the end of the day, disarmament never happened. Just resulted in a license for a rifle. And as one colonial said, all of this just for a license. And it's quite incredible, really. Um, there, there was much to be done to repair the damaged relationship. And even Chinese Gordon was brought in at one point in the immediate years after the gun war to um, intervene and he took to the field himself and was notoriously advised not to, to ride around Vesuto land by himself, but he would. And he met Letsy on several occasions before he um, obviously goes up to the Sudan. At one point, the Cape government wanted to abandon Vesuto land because they just couldn't deal with it. They requested the imperial government to take it on and they said no we won't and eventually they said they would and that of course resulted in um, independence in what is now modern day Lesotho. So there it is, two interesting um, sieges and defences, much much more to it but in the time that we've allocated we've um, put across the best message we could. I personally feel that the story of the gun war and the relentless fighting that went on um, far outweighs any other conflict at the time. You know, we're in subsequent episodes, it'd be great to be talking about the operations that went on and how the um, Cape forces found themselves fighting back to back in very small squares as they're being attacked by large numbers of mounted Basutu, some of which managed to break into the squares, jumping over guns in quite dramatic events.